Pretty much anywhere you go, some sort of fishing opportunity exists. Yet, depending on where you're at and who you're with, that opportunity might be perceived drastically different. Sometimes it's a source of entertainment, sometimes it's a source of food. For me and Marcus, we find different fishing cultures fascinating and we love new experiences. So this series is dedicated to exploring the various methods of angling within our home state of Montana and trying to catch as many species as possible. For us, anything goes. My entire life I've lived around amazing blue ribbon trout fishing, rivers that anglers flock to from around the country. Nearly every town in southwest Montana has multiple fly shops and businesses advertising to fly fishermen. And every spring, a ton of drift boats begin to show up in town and take over. The main demographic seems to consist of old dudes and bros decked out in expensive gear with thousand dollar fly rods. Kind of like this guy. There's not many things I love more in life than fly fishing. As cliche as it sounds, it's like meditation to me. I can go out on the river and forget about everything that's going on in life. Today, we're floating a river that we love fishing over here in southwest Montana. I got my buddy Cody with me. Just love dumping water out first thing. In the oh my god, dude. <laughs> it was, it was uh, ankle deep in, in my booties. <laughs> In peak season in popular spots, these blue ribbon rivers will be dotted with weight anglers maybe 30 yards apart. Stretches of river can be seen with numerous drift boats lined up, each one trying to get a crack at the same holes. But here's the thing, when it's good, it's really good. And even if there's 100 people on the river, everyone's having there a good go. day. Net when you get a chance? Yeah. Oh. Broke off right <laughs> on that rock. You win some, you lose most. <laughs> Fly fishing allows you to experience wild places in an immersive way. Being in a natural landscape, trying to understand the ecology of the river, where the trout are holding, what insects are hatching, and trying to imitate that bug that's in the river calm with a handcrafted fly to get a perfect cast and a perfect drift, it's super rewarding when nice. the trout sips that fly. Can you drop? Yeah. Little downtown brown, baby. Boy. On the board. Nice. Little whitey? Yeah. Native fish, baby. Yeah. Whitey. That's a native one, first whitey, let's go! Anything goes, baby! Anything goes! <laughs> Here we go. I've navigated the Smith in a canoe. <laughs> I think I can navigate most waters. You all right? Yeah. Well. <laughs> Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. We got one right below. Are you okay? You look like you hit hard. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Just right back into it. What are you going to be when you grow up? Minister, I guess. What are you going to be? 
first or fly fisherman? There's no such thing. There is it? There is something romantic about fly fishing. I'm pretty sure every Montanan in their teenage years watches the movie A River Runs Through It. And they go through a phase of being a little fly curious. You want to be like Brad Pitt, standing out there knee deep in a river, casting a fly line, feeling like you're moving in slow motion. Oh yeah. This is not as fun as it once was. And then when I do this, it just really makes it, it not fun. really makes it less fun. <laughs> That's my own fault. But here's something I found in my short and mostly unsuccessful fly fishing career. I really like fishing dry flies. The visual of watching a trout come to the surface to eat your fly is an unreal experience. But dry fly action only happens every so often. So you end up having to fish subsurface with nymphs. To me, this feels a hell of a lot like fishing with a worm under a bobber. So in my opinion, you might as well just use the real thing. Personally, I've bounced around, with fly fishing, bait fishing, and throwing gear. But lately, at least with trout, I find myself opportunistically reacting to whatever's going on. And if I see fish rising, I will break out the fly rod. But short of that, I almost always just throw spinners now. Here we go. Come on. Niffy may not be as cool as fishing to rising trout, but there's a lot more that goes into it than you might think. There's a whole underwater ecosystem you're trying to understand and replicate. There's tens of thousands of, of bugs just in this little tiny pool. Look at all that. Those are all, there's nymphs in there. There's cases from where they've, you know, emerged through the water column. There's some live bugs and there's, there's midges and then there's a lot of uh, bluing olives. It's crazy. Montana has some pretty sweet stream access laws. The public can use the rivers and streams for recreational purposes up to the ordinary high water mark. We can also access a navigable stream via public bridge or county road right of way. So as long as you're walking below that high water mark, you can explore endless river miles. It's not by accident that we have these amazing access laws. It's a result of hard work and advocacy by numerous groups and people, and fly fishermen were a giant voice in that effort. And we're still fighting for and defending these access laws today. There's our brown. Nice, made a fly change. This is a small one for in here, man. There it is. Oh yeah, that's a better one, boy. I need, I need my net. I got it. Yes, dude. <laughs> Look at that thing. <laughs> oh my god. Good. Downtown Brown. A little butterball. Fun fact, rainbow and brown trout, the main species that people get so worked up over in all of these blue ribbon streams, are non-native. Rainbows are one of the most widely introduced species in the world. Also, most of these blue ribbon rivers are tailwater fisheries. The rivers have been dammed for various reasons in the name of human progress. Below the dam, it creates a short stretch of temperature controlled, highly productive water that's less susceptible to major runoff events. I get a chance now. Enough of that fly fishing. <laughs> Enough of that fly fishing. These dams completely altered the habitat at the expense of many of our native fish like the cutthroat trout and arctic grayling. We subsequently stocked and managed for these non-native rainbows and brown trout which tend to outperform the native fish. Nice dude, go ahead. Let's go! <laughs> and it is what it is. It's really fun to fish for rainbow trout. But I think it's often overlooked that these fisheries have been created and that trout exist in them primarily for our entertainment. Sure, these fish do fill an ecological niche in the natural world, but I think it's important to remember that these are a non-native fish in a highly altered system.
Yeah, buddy. If you take a look back on Montana's history, there are several defining moments that led it to become the amazing trout state that it is. The Dingle Johnson Act placed an excise tax on fishing gear, and this money in turn funded fisheries biologists to look at the rivers and realize how incredibly messed up they were. Damming the rivers completely changed the system. Plus, overall watershed management was extremely poor. This new funding source, along with sportsmen advocates, prompted a serious change. These new policies helped clean up the rivers and kept them from being dewatered, but for a while, the quality of fishing was still poor. Back then, the thought process to fix the issue was to keep throwing more trout into the system, rear trout and hatcheries, and release them into the rivers. In the late 1960s, Dick Vincent, a now retired fisheries biologist, took an unpopular stance that the state should stop stocking hatchery trout into the rivers and let wild trout do their thing. This was not a popular opinion amongst anglers and even some of his peers. But after a little experimentation and proving his theory, it turns out he was right. Keeping hatchery trout out of rivers remains controversial today, but it's pretty hard to argue with the results that we've had here at Montana. Anglers continue to be the major source of funding for fisheries management through excise taxes and fishing license sales. Not only that, you have anglers contributing over a billion dollars, yes, with a B, to Montana's economy every single year. The culture and industry have grown to an incredible size, and with that kind of money being thrown around, you're damn sure the local businesses are wanting that industry to thrive. You know, it's just it's exciting, it's nerve-wracking, I just can't help myself. I gotta get one more dig in on fly fishing culture. The vast majority of fly fishermen on these blue ribbon stretches practice catch and release. A mindset exists that keeping a trout is taboo, yet many fly anglers will torture and play to exhaustion numerous fish in a day. Some of these trout will undoubtedly die later because of it. Personally, I'm a big fan of taking some of these tasty fish out of the river. But let's be honest, recreational fishing is closely monitored by the state, so whether you're torturing fish or eating fish, in most scenarios, you're not having a huge impact on the system, especially compared to environmental factors such as this heat wave we're currently in. And if you are out fishing for trout in the crazy heat, you may as well eat them because you're killing them either way. It's just crazy to me how prominent the catch and release culture is. Seriously, it's kind of strange that we get so much joy out of piercing a fish's mouth, watching it struggle for a few minutes, putting our grubby hands on it, and then letting it go. It's weird. Don't get me wrong, I torture and release plenty of fish too, but I definitely made sure to take some home. I had a few trout saved up for the smoker, so we had a full sampler. Rainbow, brown, brook, and cutthroat trout. And don't worry, those cutthroat came from a stocked lake. So this is where we are now. A culture exists of fishermen extremely passionate about torturing these non-native fish in these tailwater rivers. But in the world of conservation, this angling culture has done so much good. Without a doubt, a net positive exists from these anglers caring so much about wild places and wild trout, even if they are basically spotted river carp. Go ahead. Any fly fishermen around? <laughs> <laughs> no native fish were harmed in the thinking of this. <laughs> in the next episode of Any Fins, we're looking for giant prehistoric fish in Montana's murky water. You definitely don't want to miss this barbaric redneck activity. <laughs> 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 <laughs>